Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the Columbia class. All the Columbia classes. That's the important thing. All the Columbia classes. If you don't mind, I'm just going to do one thing. <sighs> I forgot to turn the plug on. <laughs> so, what do I mean by all the Columbia classes? Well, of course, I'm going to be talking about the 1892 class, but it would be churlish of me to talk about the Columbia class if I don't also discuss both their Star Trek iteration and the submarine, which is currently being built, the Columbia class submarine, or maybe District of Columbia class submarine. But I'll get into all of those at the end. So. If you are interested in Star Trek and how that relates to has some interesting facts for naval cruisers and of this period and how it interacts, that's going to be a slide at the end. And if you're interested in current submarine construction, that's going to also be a slide at the end. Today's though, main focus is part of the 19th century cruiser series, and that is the Columbia class. And Oh my, <laughs> they are special ships. They are ships which are designed around one crucial core philosophy. And that philosophy is we want something long range. We want something capable of commerce raiding. In fact, the theory was that they should be able to overtake and destroy fast ocean liners of the day because they're most worried about ocean liners, which were, of course, majoritively not owned by America at this point. And one of the biggest powers with ocean liners, of course, was Britain. Now, there is an argument as to whether this is about commerce interdiction or commerce protection, because there's always the point that with fast ocean liners, they could theoretically be turned into armed merchant cruisers, which could then be used for commerce interdiction. And if they can outpace all your cruisers, you're in trouble. But <clears throat> there is also one other big problem for this. Designing a ship which is specifically designed to hunt down such ships rather rests on those ships staying fairly constant. And the trouble is there was a race for speed amongst the ocean liners. So these vessels were built between 1890 and 1894. They cost roughly two and three quarter million dollars for the hull and machinery. They are pretty much outclassed in terms of speed by ocean liners in terms of the ability of those ocean liners to maintain a constant high speed probably in the early 1900s by 1907 they are definitely outclassed in speed so 13 years there's Lusitania and Kronzprinz Celisiel of the Germans which are fully outpacing them but still they are protected cruisers and they are the Columbia class. And they show, to an extent, an early version of the problem which I'm currently delving into with the American interwar cruisers. In that the Americans, God love them, and we do, because the US is one of those sea powers which are most interesting. I know I have colleagues, a former supervisor, oh, my PhD supervisor, when I did that, Andrew Lambert and others who will tell you that America isn't really a sea power state. They often adopt attributes and cornerstone parts of being a sea power state, but they're always one step away from not wanting to be it. So they don't really have the mentality of a sea and necessary to be a sea power state. I would suggest that's more a facet of American politics and their the peculiar institution is the Congress, which 
seems to always have a desire to try and disband the US Navy rather than the American people or Amer America as a group, as a sort of nation. It's just a quirk of their politics. But I can also see where my colleagues are coming from because of that. However, on this occasion, we are dealing with a class which is actually pushed through by a politician because he wants something from the Navy. Admittedly, this is a former naval officer who has turned into a politician. But you know. Now, it's not only the Columbia class which are built on this idea. There's also the Kaiserin Augusta and other vessels which were built with the idea of going fast enough to be able to take out these super these liners, these ocean liners. Even the British look at it at certain points and go, should we? Do we need to? Then the British look at it and go, what happens if we have a fast enough ship sitting at near the ports where they're going to? Ooh, so you mean we don't do a tail chase across the ocean, we're just waiting for them where they arrive? Yeah, that works. That really does. And it's cheaper. And it means we don't have to make quite so many compromises for speed. There are a lot of compromises for speed in the Columbia class. They are gorgeous, but they are a compromised design. As any design which is limited by certain specific criteria is always going to be. We've talked about this again with the interwar cruisers, 1920s, 1930s. They are limited by treaty. So there's a tonnage limitation, which means all their designs, even the ones where they ignore the treaties. Please notice, even the ones where they ignore the treaties are compromised by the treaties because there is the design of cruiser they would like to build and then the design of cruiser they think they can get away with building and looking close enough to the treaties that they can fudge it so that no one else will call them on it. And that's what they have to go with. They have to go with the line of the cruiser which they think they can fudge and get away with, not the cruiser they would like to build. So those people who bring up the cruisers and go, well, you know, these are what cruisers would actually have been because, you know, this is what they built and these people were breaking the treaty. They're still not building the cruiser they want to build. Let's be honest, the Japanese did not want to build the paper tigers they built. We would have liked a well-balanced ship. The Japanese, if you consider what they've got a tradition of building, it's very balanced, finely balanced, but well-balanced ships. Suddenly treaties come in and they are building ships which are top heavy, paper thin armor. Anyway, the politician who's so critical to this all is this wonderful gentleman, Charles A. Boutel. Now, Charles Boutel had served the United States Navy during the American Civil War. He took part in several major battles, including this one, which are pictured here, which of course is Mobile Bay. Now, he under the command of Admiral David Farragut. Now, the important thing is he was a merchant sailor before that. He was a, had been a ship's master and he was promoted to volunteer lieutenant and allowed to be commander of a ship. And actually at Mobile Bay, he was credited with receiving the surrender of the Confederate fleet because of all the events that happened there and was placed in command of the Union Naval Forces in the Mississippi Sound afterwards because of his service and his his, his duty. He would marry after he left naval service, uh, a lady called Elizabeth Lizzie Hodson, daughter of an attorney and Maine Adjutant General John L. Hodson uh, in 1866 in Augusta. And they had three daughters, Grace Hodson Boutel, Elizabeth Boutel, and Anne Annie Curtis Boutel. Annie Boutel is, was the sponsor of the protected cruiser Newark the US Navy's first modern cruiser in 1890. And she's a fine looking ship as well, but we're looking about the Columbia class today. Now, can I find the buttons? After the war, he also became uh, a master of steamer and then were, uh, he became editor in chief of the Bangor Daily Whig and Courier, a Republican newspaper. Eventually, 
he managed to draw the attention of the Republican Party, and he was selected as a district delegate for, to, to the Republican National Convention in Cincinnati in 1876. And he goes up. He goes up the, uh, the rolls and becomes a, USS, a U.S. representative. He becomes the Republican candidate for the 4th Main Congressional District. He's narrowly defeated. He is then elected Maine representative at large to the 48th Congress in 1882 and subsequently elected to the 4th District representative in every election after that until his death his resignation in 1901. Because of his maritime background and his status, he served as chairman of the House of Naval Affairs Committee in the 51st, 54th, 55th and 56th Congresses. Wow! Someone who was a merchant mariner who understood merchant marine issues and maritime issues, who had served as an eminent, a prominent and successful naval officer if restricted by the terms of service to a, a relatively junior rank in a war, and becomes a politician, is an ardent naval campaigner. And he's a very good one as well. Basically, the US Navy buildup of the 1890s is 50% Charles A. Boutel, 50%, well, no, honestly, 25% Mahan, and 25% probably Teddy Roosevelt. Now, Teddy Roosevelt's 25% comes towards the end of the period, so it's all in one big chunk. So it's over. It's almost a hundred percent in some years, and Mahan's is a little sort of dribble the whole way through. But Botel is the one who manages to build and succor and support the U.S. Navy into the status at which Roosevelt can actually do what he does. Uh, the fact that Bath Ironworks got so many orders was, I'm sure, nothing to do with the fact that. He had the position he did have, and of course, Bath Ironworks is still with us to this day, thanks to his support. He made speeches on the question of Hawaiian annexation in the 53rd Congress, the border dispute with Great Britain and Venezuela in the 54th Congress, and several other foreign policy uh, issues. He was an eminent and respected speaker by both sides of the aisle. And in April 1898, Boutel was one amongst the six representatives who voted against declaring war on Spain. Yeah. The guy who'd served in a naval war, who'd fought for the strongest navy he could for the US, didn't think it was appropriate to declare war on Spain. On such a flimsy pretext. Don't know about you, but when I listen to, to, to discussions about this gentleman, my respect for him grows even more. Now, with the Columbia class, well, there was significant opposition against them. In fact, there was significant opposition, and there was so much opposition, there was sole bidders on it. And I'll be talking about William Cramp and Sons of Philadelphia later. They were the sole bidders. They ended up building them. And in fact, even though Bath Ironworks, that yard he supports so much, bid a cheaper offer the next year, at that time, they couldn't build their own engines, and they couldn't complete the shipping time. So the contract went to Cramp again for Minneapolis on the condition that they lowered their price by $55,000 to meet Bath's bid. Mm -hmm. Why was there so much opposition to these ships? Well, it's partially down to what this gentleman was designing into them. George W. Melville, the engineer. Technically, at this point, is the Chief of Bureau and Steam Engineering. He is a renowned Arctic explorer, 
Um, including in his medals for that were the awards of the Gold Jeanette Medal, which he received in 1890. Uh, he had the rank of Rear Admiral after a few years. Uh, he started off as being the Engineer-in-Chief, and they gave him a uh, Rear Admiralty role. Service years, 1861 to 1903, he, of course, was a major part of the American Civil War, where his engineering skills were critical. And he was an incredibly experienced and capable engineer. He was also an incredibly experienced and capable advocate. Between him and Boutel, the poor Congress probably didn't have anywhere to go. It's... Like you have one of your number who is shouting at you every chance he gets in a very persuasive way to build these ships. And then every time he needs a very erudite person to come off and explain exactly how capable a ship you want to build, exactly what role you wanted to do and what engineering feats it want to accomplish with it, you have this decorated, venerated, extremely erudite and understanding engineer to come and talk with you. Honestly, I'm surprised the politicians only managed to uh, get away with paying for two. I have a feeling if they'd wanted more, they would have just kept talking until the politicians, uh, the rest of the politicians were just handing over a blank checkbook and going, please, just stop with the words. We don't understand you. Here's money. Go away. These ships would be designed with 21,000 indicated horsepower, which was in excess of the Brooklyn class's 16,000, and double that, roughly, of some of the battleships in service. This meant these ships to deploy that power and deploy what they were going to get had to be a triple screw arrangement, the first in US Navy service. Now, there is then a discussion over boilers. I have put it down as, and at least two sources I've read have listed as such as eight double-ended boilers and two single boilers. But some say that Columbia had eight and ten in Minneapolis. I'm not sure, and I'm especially not sure why Minneapolis would gain more boilers despite being the cheaper ship, the one the yard was getting less money for. If anything, I would expect Columbia to get more boilers because and the yard's looking to recruit their money. $55,000 in this time is not a cheap amount of money. Now, the Bureau of Steam Engineering is an interesting organization, and I just wanted to quickly talk about them because I've talked about other bureaus in the past, and in this series, I've talked about the Bureau of Construction and Repair. Well, the Bureau of Steam Engineering has a timeline created by the Naval Appropriations Act of 5th of July 1862, uh, receiving some of the duties of the former Bureau of Construction, Equipment, and Repair. Mm -hmm. It became, by Naval uh, it, became by Naval Approach Act of 4th June 1920, the Bureau of Engineering. And then in 1940, it is combined with the Bureau of Construction Repair, again, which, remember, it had been divided off, to become the Bureau of Ships. So, that's his little history. Now, this is a marked change for engineering because, well, if I give you an example, previously, when they first set up anything to support engineering for the US Navy, um, it had not been set up so well. In 1842, when the Corps, the Engineering Corps for Navy was first authorized, the first engineer was uh, in chief was a gentleman called Gilbert L. Thompson, who was a great scholar, a great diplomat, a wonderful lawyer, but no knowledge of engineering whatsoever. He therefore couldn't speak for engineers in the Navy, uh, nor could he judge engineering problems. And these are the words, of course, of Admiral Rick Rover, who I've got a lovely quote here from. And this quote is to do with the creation of engineering. 
Engineering both in the operating the shipboard machinery and in the design and construction of ships became critically important with the outbreak of the Civil War. The Navy had to blockade a coastline stretching over 3,000 miles from the Pontiac to the Mexican border. It had to support the army on the rivers. It had to search out and destroy Confederate raiders. For all these purposes, the steam engine and the engineer were indispensable. On the day of battle, steam engines drove the Monitor and the Merrimack, the Kesarge and the Alabama as well as the gunboats which supported Grant before Fort Donelson and Vicksburg. In 1862, the Congre Congress recognized the importance of engineering by creating the Bureau of Steam Engineering. Now, okay, that is all very true. However, then he goes all Rick Rovery. When Lee surrendered, the United States Navy was the most effective sea power in the world. <clears throat> okay, um, it was very good. It was very capable. But there was one, possibly two navies in the world who, were, who would, could probably be arguing at this point quite heavily at this time, and a third one which would like to be arguing the point. And a fourth one potentially waiting in the wings to argue the point. And that fourth one, by the way, is Brazil. Uh, that position depended upon engineering, which in turn was based on the skill of Benjamin F. Isherwood, first chief of the Bureau of Steam Engineering. Luckily for their first chief of the Bureau of Steam Engineering, rather than the Corps of Engineers, they had gone for someone who had designed and built engines rugged enough to withstand the shock of combat, as well as ill treatment by poorly trained operating engineers. He also designed and constructed a well-armed cruiser, which was faster than any abroad. In addition, American naval leadership rested upon ingenious civil engineers and inventors such as John Erickson, who designed and built the Monitor. All wonderful glowing things. All great things. And that is where we'd leave it. However, there's a rather interesting thing if we look across at that list of engineers in chief. They're engineers in chief, yes. The vitals of the ship. Sorry, my stand, my table's a little small, so this keeps ricketing a bit. Uh, Benjamin Franklin Sherd, uh, engineer in chief. James Wilson King, engineer in chief. William Willis Wood, engineer in chief. Okay, finally they decided to give them a naval rank. Uh, William Henry Shock, Commodore. Charles Harding Loring, Commodore. Finally, and this is important, this is the important rank in the US Navy at this time. Remember, for many, many years, the US Navy does not have vice admirals, admirals, or anything like that, which you can actually get a rise to the rank of. You, the highest rank you can go is rear admiral. Everything else is a temporary appointment given to you for the post you're in, not an actual rank you can claim to have. You're operating with that rank. You have that rank as a for virtue of the position you're in not because you actually have that rank you're not a vice admiral rear admiral and it's no surprise that the person who's rear admiral first is george wallace melville he is as mentioned a noted arctic explorer rewarded for bravery in both the civil war and arctic expeditions he is a very capable engineer and also a very capable in the politics of procurement and of getting funding. This is something which is often forgotten. He is very critical for getting the funding for various parts, including hundreds of thousands of dollars for, build, uh, for training schools and testing facilities in Annapolis and other places so that he could actually properly test engines and properly train young engineers it's amazing he get he's one worried about funding something and it's funding the infrastructure of education mm -hmm. so we've talked about about these ships what are their vital statistics well they're 7375 long tons that's 7493 tons okay all right, there are many cruisers in that level. These are protected cruisers. Their beam is 17.74 meters, which makes them fat, but not that fat. 
126 meters long. That's 412 feet for those who like Imperial. And 6.87 meters in draft or 22 foot, six and a half inches. Now, as you see, I've listed as eight double-ended and two single steam boilers, single-ended steam boilers, supplying three vertical triple expansion engines to generate 21,000 indicated horsepower to drive three shafts for a design top speed of 22 and a half knots or designed range of 25,520 nautical miles at 10 knots. Which is an excessive amount of range, isn't it? It really is for this period. It's a massive amount of range. Now, why would they want such a range? Why would they need such a range? Well, it's very simple. These are supposed to be commerce raiders. These are supposed to be the vessels that could get them around the world. But on trial, Minneapolis actually managed 23.7 knots, Z 07 knots. Usually though, it was 21 knots. Columbia managed 23 knots actually uh, quite often, but her speed on trial was 22.8 knots. It really did depend on the quality of coal they got. It really did depend. And it's like the theoretical range it's a lovely theoretical range to have. It certainly gives you some status and some capabilities, but that is a designed range, and I don't think they ever actually got it. In fact, honestly, mm, considering their full coal allowance was 1,500 tons, roughly, it's unlikely. Especially as, theoretically, for them to do the 25,000, not miles, they're supposed to be carrying 2,130 tons of coal. Yeah. Anyway, though, in uh, July 1895, Columbia made the transatlantic crossing from Southampton to Sandy Hook in six days, 23 hours and 49 minutes, an average speed of 18.41 knots. This was without forced draft and was considered the fastest crossing to date by that point. And was a big status of intent, honestly, for the Americans. It was showing, hang on, we're here you need to take us notice of us. We have very fast, very capable cruisers. Unfortunately, remember what I said about the uh, criteria they were built with being fast enough to hunt down the fastest cruise liners? And officially, of course, they're not exceeded until, you know, 1907. The problem is the record holder in 1895 was um, the Hamburg America Line's first Bismarck which had achieved the same crossing in six days, 10 hours and 32 minutes. Now I realize, I do realize that is only a advantage of 13 hours and 17 minutes. But 13 hours and seven minutes me is far, uh, faster, is 13 hours and 17 minutes faster. And it suggests you didn't catch her, did you? We'll put it down to weather and lucky steaming. Now, the complement, 477, 30 officers, 447 are listed. As built, one eight inch gun, two six inch guns, eight four inch guns, 12 six pounders, four one pounders, four gatling guns, Four 14 inch torpedo tubes. Some people write these as 18 inch, but I'm not sure. I'm going with the 14 inch because I've seen more sources saying the 14 inch. I'm mentioning the fact that some say 18 inch, but I've seen more sources talking about the 14 inch. And honestly, 
considering the amount of effort they had to put into trying to save space on these ships so they could take a huge, whopping, great big amount of engine space, I would be tempted to think the 14-inch would make more sense. You could actually stow some, you know, reloads then. Um, by 1920, they had three 6-inch um, 45 cal Mark 10 guns, uh, four 4-inch four guns, two 3-inch guns, four 3-pounders, and two 1-pounder guns. They had 4-inch protective deck armor on the slopes, two and a half inches on the flats. The gun shields, four inches thick. The gun sponsons, four inches thick. The conning tower, five inches thick. They had lots of armor. However, the fact is the 4,000 ton Baltimore class had similar armor to that of the Columbia's. So this is why they're called protected cruisers, not first class protected cruisers or second class protected cruisers, because they're the size and displacement of a first class protected cruiser. But you wouldn't want to get in a fight with a first class protected cruiser. Now, admittedly, you theoretically have the speed. 23 knots is definitely enough to get away from a 20 knot Edgar class. As long as you're at speed. <laughs> Remember, you take time to build up speed, just as they do. If they're already going at 20, plus, uh, 20 knots or close to it, and you're caught at low 10 knots, it's going to take you a while to get up to 23 to get away, and that could be all they need. But Columbia was still a special ship. Not always the most successful, and because of their lack of armor, not always the first choice for action. Uh, she was named for the city of Columbia in South Carolina. She was launched in July 1892, sponsored by Miss Edith Morton. Completed in May 1893. Technically acquired in December 1893, when they finally paid for her, the final mount, and commissioned April 1894. Decommissioned August 1919. Hmm. Renamed Old Columbia in November 1921. Reclassified as CA-16 in July 1920. And stricken in January 1922. Fun times. She's a good ship, though. She is. Now... Originally, the class was designed with three funnels, but Columbia was built with four and Minneapolis with two. Some have suggested this is to make them resemble passenger liners at the time, but I don't think so. I think it's just a reflection of the improvements in funnel design and funnel operations and the ability of, to get the maximum air out of those funnels. Now, Columbia joined the North Atlantic Squadron, and from the 30th of July, 1894, to the 5th of January, 1895, was part of the Caribbean Patrol. She participated in the Nicaragua intervention and between July and August, 1894. She then visited Europe in the summer, 1895, representing the US at the ceremonial opening of the Kiel Canal. Again, it's important sending this ship out. If you think about it, she's a couple of years old. A couple of years into her service. You're sending her, well, te le technically less than a year. A couple of years since acquired, a year into her, into her commission. And you're sending her to the Kiel Canal. You're sending a very high status unit. The, mo uh, the most worked up unit you new unit you have because let's be honest a new unit which is freshly being built will not be worked up so this one's new and it's been in service a year so you've got it worked up to go and show yeah this is what we can have this is what we have going on look how fast look how mean our cruisers are british and germans are probably looking at going hmm fast sexy armor lacking Hmm. Okay. And people say the battle cruiser comes from nowhere. I mean, seriously. 
Hello. <laughs> oh. People have been dropping armor for speed for years. On 25 April 1896, the passenger steamer Wyonaki um, struck an anchored ship in Newport News, Virginia, and sank. Uh, Wyonaki had 107 passengers and 42 crew aboard. And, well, two passengers and one crew drowned, and one crewman died of injuries in the uh, hospital. That ship, which they struck at anchor, was the Columbia. This was while she was waiting around in ordinary, basically, in ter British terminology. Uh, recommissioned in March 1898 for sp service in the Spanish-American War, she patrolled the Atlantic coast and the West Indies until August. She conveyed troops to Puerto Rico, and this is her on night patrol and taking part in that, and aided its occupation between July and August, and was then decommissioned and placed in reserve in, 18, uh, in March 1899. She's next recommissioned in August 1902, serving as a receiving ship in New York uh, from November 1903 as part of the Atlantic Training Squadron. Once more, out of commission from 1907 to 19, June 1915. So she spent a lot of time in reserve, a lot of time being sat around. She then joined the submarine flotilla as flagship and cruised between the various Atlantic submarine bases on inspection tours. She was detached in April 1917, and, well, she then became flagship of, patrol squ of Squadron 5 Patrol Force, joining the cruiser force as a convoy escort later on. Uh, between 1st of January and 13th of November 1918, she made five Atlantic escort voyages, protecting the AEF, that's the American Expeditionary Force, Transferring, transferring to France. On 7th of January 1919, she became the flagship of Squadron 2 Destroyer Force Atlantic Fleet, operated on the East Coast and in the Caribbean. So she's relieved in May, but continued assisting until decommissioned at the Philadelphia Yard in June 1921. During her time, she won the Samson Medal, the Navy Expeditionary Medal, the Spanish Campaign Medal, the Cuban Pacification Medal, and the World War I Victory Medal with the Atlantic Fleet Clasp. She was a well-decorated ship, and she was useful. And again, this is the point. Think about how much time she spent in reserve. I keep talking about this for these fleets, but it was a perfectly normal thing. We have to get back to this idea. We have now the idea you only build the ships you need in peacetime, and you build them all first rate and you only think of the best of the best ships being able to fight wars and being useful in war fighting. And you need those ships. You by gum do you need those ships as the core of your force. But you also need more ships in wartime than you do in peacetime. And there are duties where you can afford to have Vessels which are perhaps not first rate in terms of modern understanding to do perform them and to assist with them. And that's always been the way. It's only, I think it's only really, e even in the Cold War, when I think about it really clearly, there wasn't such a solid perception. It was coming about in the Cold War, but that was because the idea was any war would be short, very, very decisive, very, very technology, and then very, very nuclear. Once they started thinking it might get longer, then they started worrying about things. Hmm. Ah, well. William Camp and, Son uh, Camp and Sons. Now, this is a yard. They went defunct in 1947, but they were founded in 1830 by William Cramp. Now, he is the gentleman at the top. Then there is Henry, I think, his... No, Charles. Charles Henry, I think, is uh, this gentleman in 1900. Sorry, why did I think he was Henry? Hmm. <laughs> He is Charles Henry. <laughs> Phew, that's where I got the Henry from. Anyway, this is 
one of those yards which just build stuff and they do it really well they built the indiana the massachusetts the new york the columbia the minneapolis of course as well they built pilot boat thomas howard they built all sorts of vessels and in they kept building ships they were an iron and shipbuilding and engineering company, and they were really successful in Kensington, Kensington, Philadelphia. Now, interesting enough, three of those ships uh, of the Indiana, US, uh, the Indiana, the USS Massachusetts, and I think it was the New York, took part in the Battle of Santiago de Cuba. Uh, it, this battle is, of course, often heralded as uh, one of the key points on the path to America becoming the great America, a great power status. I'm not quite so sure in that particular battle's case, but I'd say being able to mass that amount of naval firepower in one place and fight such a battle certainly does show you are getting to being a major player. In 1919, the yard is bought by the American Shipping and Commercial Corporation, who don't prove as capable of getting orders as the Cramps had, or maybe they're just not as politically connected. Or they prefer other yards that they own. But they buy it in 1919, it closes in 1927. This is often blamed on the uh, Naval Limitations Treaties, as the US Navy is not ordering so many ships. But honestly, they proved not that good at getting merchant shipping orders as well. That's thus in 1940, the US Navy had to spend $22 million to reopen the yard as cramped shipbuilding to build cruisers and submarines. Unfortunately, poor management delivered. Uh, essentially undermined the delivery of their submarines and it took two years to deliver after keel laying the best construction time achieved for a submarine was 644 days it's a sad sad time and apparently part of the site still sits empty to this day which is sad because it is a yard which was full of activity and full of industry. And probably if it had been kept, managed to keep going and had carried on the way the cramps intended it, so it would have been a yard up there with bath, ironworks, etc., but would also still be competing for merchant construction because they very much considered themselves they considered themselves they were modeling themselves on what they considered the great yards of the world and they were shamelessly trying to match that profile of being both known as a great liner constructor as building steamships freight and passenger ships as well as warships ah the minneapolis ah oh. I love Minneapolis. I got some very nice pizza last time I was near there. Anyway, so assigned, like I said, to the North Atlantic Squadron. She took part in maneuvers and cruised along the eastern seaboard and West Indies. Um, she then went to the European Squadron in 1895, arriving at Gibraltar in December. Cruised the Mediterranean Sea, visited Kronstadt, Russia, um, between May and June 1896, was flagship of Rear Admiral Thomas Selfridge, uh, representing the uh, U.S. at the coronation of Tsar Nicholas II. Hmm. Always fun. Following on, did visits to all sorts of ports in Europe, uh, Turkey and Greece, and, well... Departed June 1897 to arrive in Philadelphia on the 6th of July, just missing out on the parties on the 4th, and then was placed in reserve at League Island Navy Yard. 
She's reactivated, again, like her sister. Uh, for the Spanish-American War, she joins the Northern Patrol, operating on the Northern Atlantic Coast, scouting duty in the West Indies, searching for Admiral Sarah's fleet. Uh, she has a good time doing that little hunting operations. Then decommissioned again before being recommissioned for the Louisiana Purchase Celebration in New Orleans. Hmm. Then went for a cruise around the West Indies, arrived at New London, Connecticut in May 1905 to participate in the unveiling of the John Winthrop Monument. Uh, then went with the Special Service Squadron with the Collier Caesar and the Screw Steamer Dixie under the command of Rear Admiral Colby Mitchell Chester to make astronomical and uh, scientific observations off the coast of Spain and Africa. The fact that this also happened to be a massive boost in the presence and was used for a whole load of diplomatic functions and just look at uh, We have all support and everything and look at us, we can turn up here too and how big and powerful and sexy and cool our ship is is entirely off to one side. It was entirely about the science it was all about the science. It was all about the science. I won't hear anyone say it wasn't entirely about the science. That is the entire reason they had to send a cruiser, a screw steamer, and a collier all the way to go to Spain and Africa and, you know, and to go up and down the coast to make scientific observations. You, they sent a self-supported squadron to just for the science. <sighs> she arrived at Gibraltar on the 17th of, 19, uh, of July 1905, carrying scientists to observe the solar eclipse, and which took place on the uh, 13th of August. Let's go back and finish off her. She then took departed the Mediterranean in November 1905, sailed via France and the UK, uh, to eventually arriving in Hampton Roads on 23rd December. Hmm. Uh, she took part in ceremonies commemorating the arrival of the body of John Paul Jones and took some midshipmen on a practice cruise and then decommissioned, only to be uh, recommissioned after remaining ordinary until uh, when the United States entered into World War One. She started off 1917 going to the Panama Canal Zone, where she joined the Arrow and Corinthia, which were British transports. Uh, they sailed from Colón on the 6th of November and steamed by, via, by way of Hampton Roads by Hampton Roads, to no Halifax, Nova Scotia, where, of course, Sackville currently resides. That is the last remaining flower-class Corvette. She continued to wander along the Atlantic coast and sold the sign to Transalacic convoy duty in February 1918, and during the next eight, the following eight months, um, she made four voyages. The voyages would go as us. She'd depart New York, sail to an ocean rendezvous, where their convoys were turned over to British destroyers. On her last voyage, she depart departed New York on 9th of October, escorting a convoy for to Sydney, Nova Scotia, and would return to New York by the 19th of October. So it's a 10-day trip. She's then assigned to the Pacific Station as flagship, I arrived in California, San Diego, in February 1919. And then two, she is decommissioned at Mare Island Naval Yard two years later. 15th of March 1921, sold on the 5th of August 1921. Uh, you'll find her mast preserved on the northeastern shore of Bede Macascar, near Lake Street, in Minneapolis. The bell is currently in use at Minnetoka uh, High School. They are an interesting class, and I think the name on the card says it all really for me. The United States Commerce Destroyer Columbia. When you consider them protected cruisers, you start having to fit them into the rating system. Are they a first class, second class, or third class protected cruiser? 
Well, the thing is, they don't have the armor to be a first class. They have the speed to top all three. But they don't have the armor to be a first class. Probably a second class, but then their speed. So I rather like that designation of them being a commerce destroyer. They are commerce destroying ships. They could either escort your very fast ocean liners or they could hunt them down and destroy them. Now, I do consider that a bit excessive myself. As mentioned earlier, the easier way would be to just be where those liners are going to be. I blockade. But you have to respect if two people like Melville and Bolton are quite so obsessed with the idea of these vessels, you must suspect that they are not certain that a blockade is the way to go. They are not certain that a blockade will necessarily deliver the results they wanted to. And if that's the case, then we have to understand it. And if we understand it and think, well, maybe they're just going for an insurance policy here, these ships are very good. There's also the fact of how would you put a blockade on a power which is stronger than you? You are viable in terms of fighting the Confederacy. You were able to overpower them. And then it was difficult enough to implement a blockade. But if you're fighting who? Well, anyone you're fighting you're going to be fighting at the end of your logistics train. Okay, Spain. They're fairly easy. But they're not who you build to fight against. Because if you're building to fight against Spain, you haven't set yourself much of a target at this time. They are not really funding anything. As we've been over before in our discussions about the Spanish-American War, the fact that there were some egg fleets which were supposed to be principal fleets and key capabilities of their forces that hadn't done an actual exercise in more than a decade when their admirals got to them and went, Oh, great. Mm, doesn't really make them that strong to uh, think about. So, life is fun. So who are they building these against? Well, there's only two powers who are really getting into the, uh, the ocean line of the race. France does turn up occasionally, but mainly it's German and Britain. And America will be part of it as well. So, these are a threat to those two. Are they really a threat to Britain? No, because I have a sneaking suspicion that wherever either Colombia or Minneapolis turned up, they would probably catch the liners, probably not in the middle of the ocean. They'd probably catch them closer to the shore, closer to the harbour. In which case, they would probably find an Edgar class waiting for them. And it wouldn't matter that they were slower. The cruise liner would slow down to whatever speed the Edgar class was happily pottling along at. And it would be a case of, well, you have to get into range of that thing to be able to attack her. That's the trouble with taking on the British at this time. The British government at this time have a policy of, if in doubt, buy a dozen. Especially when it comes to commerce protection and commerce interdiction. They're buying them by the dozen. It, they say never get in an argument with someone who buys ink by the barrel. Never get in an argument with a nation which doesn't understand buying single digits of any weapon system in the 19th century. They just don't comprehend it. Single digits? Why? Why? You buy double digits. Okay, they might not buy that or double digits of a class, but they'll be buying double digits of cruisers every year. 
What have we got coming up? We have the Shapiev class. The Soviet Navy. Ships of a nation which didn't understand single digit procurement for many, many things, but seem to get rather obsessed with it when it comes to naval procurement. Hmm. And then it's the town class in 27th of September. Of course, the area is the common joke about those that sometimes Royal Navy admirals would get radio messages coming in from parts of the world and get finally, I find it's a squadron of town class cruisers asking for instructions and they're going. Does that squadron exist or am I being ghost goosed by someone? Is someone pulling my leg? No, that squadron exists. How many town class cruisers do we have again? Are we sure they aren't multiplying behind the couches? We are absolutely positive. We sure. This is not Fisher magically standing over a pot somewhere going, hubble, bubble, boil and trouble, give me another a town class button, a town class on a double. You know, what is happening here? So, it's always fun though. It's the Birmingham's. Ah, right. As promised, the NX class refit. Now, this is a wonderful thing that you can do in space. You cannot do it on seafaring ships. Well, you can. You do do it on on liners quite regularly. I know a couple of lining uh, liner companies which have done this, where they have literally cut cut the ship in half and added a section in the middle in this case what happens is that after the federation is sort of formed almost before the federation is formed the annex class are great vessels they're built a lot of them but they now have all sorts of technologies from the Andorians, the Vulcans, and other allies which they formed together after the war with the Romulans. They need to find a way to include these technologies in these ships. But a ship is a finite amount of space. And what you would have to do with a surface ship, a warship in our current times, is you would have to take stuff off and then put stuff in or decide what you couldn't put in or build a whole new ship. What they do here is redesign where the uh, <coughs> where the shuttle bays go in and out uh, and add in a secondary hull and form a profile which is going to become the Federation form for centuries to come. It's basically all they've done is taken this NX design and added that bit on the bottom. And that allows them to get in the new warp core, that allows them to get a new uh, deflector array, that allows them to get in all sorts of equipment. Uh, new accommodations were improved. Well, some people mention or talk a lot about how they get uh, expanded accommodations for the senior officers. Well, most of that's down to them being expected to do more diplomatic and dipl uh, diplomatic space. After experience on these vessels, where doing diplomacy was found to be brigading difficult, it really was. Interesting, of course, it's um, by this point Admiral Archer, who insists that the class now be called the Columbia class after the Enterprise's sister ship which of course was lost now that's a rather cool bit of history a bit of star trek here star trek history and of course this was columbia and enterprise actually performing a very very intricate warp core or warp maneuver to get one vessel out of warp bubble into another one's warp bubble and save it But yeah, 
What is so cool about the uh, the ships is that they really do link back to this era's starships. Because whilst these are sleek, beautiful designs, if you look at the designs of the cruisers in the 1890s, they're supposed to be sleek and beautiful as well. The trouble is technology changes so much. And the amount of them which are still in service 20, 30 years later, when if we think about the technological difference between 1890s and the 1920s, there are airplanes. There are motor cars everywhere. There are all sorts of things which have changed in the world. Radio communications is now becoming more and more current. The Germans will never learn how to do broadcasts on anything less than full power, but radio communications are becoming more and more current. It is a changing world. These ships, according to some accounts, are in service for hundreds of years. Technology changes dramatically. Again, I can see why in space, but honestly, I'd be worried about the strains and stresses put on the hulls by their various scientific operations. Whilst I do understand that in whilst they're in warp, fl warp flight, uh, they have the warp bubble around them, so theoretically not much strain put on, on the hull in the warp bubble, because they're in the bubble. But coming in and out of the bubble, um, any planetary operations, any even gas giant operations, etc., is going to put a strain on that hull. But are obviously better at maintaining hull life than we are with, uh, when faced with salt water. Ugh. That ship killing stuff. What have we got coming up? Ah, yes. 16th September. Five ways to fix the fleets of World War II, 1941-42. And that is tomorrow night. I hope you've been joining me. Um, it will be a very interesting place to be presenting from. I think it's going to be different from where I was last time. Not sure. But I'm looking forward to it. And I am... I'm looking forward also to getting back to a regular schedule. Hopefully and sorting out the computer and then probably november if i've managed to get the funds organized going off on research trips i would this is going to sound strange my one of my research trip plans is to go to blenheim uh blenheim palace where churchill of course was uh, raised Hunting for some details about him, but mainly hunting for some details about his various correspondence and his early life to factor into some of my early theorists of steel stuff. Because I'm looking at the ones who came before Henderson as well as Henderson himself for that. It's been interesting. I'm also going to be doing some research trips to do with the Flag class Corvettes and hopefully U class submarines. So, yeah funding and everything falling into place as hopefully it will do um, if I work very hard and I'm very lucky and the publishers are very very nice or I though I am getting more and more tempted by the concept of self-publishing on Kindle for short books that's 45 to 60 thousand words in my language um, but that again is something I'm waiting for a new computer because I need to track down software for that and vellum only works on Macs, so I'm going to have to look see if I can find a Vellum equivalent or a system which can allow me to make Vellum think it's working on a Mac when it's working on a PC, because I don't want to buy a Mac, because if I buy a Mac, I will then become magically, by appropriation, responsible for at least two more of my family members' IT issues, and I don't want that. I love them dearly, but I don't. But no, I'm looking forward to the uh, Battle of Arusio. It's not often I get to talk about Asian land battles, but I do occasionally like to. And the Battle of Navarino in 1827. So I'm going some really early battles. We also have coming up Patreon 62, Daniel Freeman's What If the French Navy Had Left France and Carried On the Fight in, Fran in 1940. It's an interesting one. 
And Patreon 63, Ian Carr, Escort Carries, the Idea, Designs, Development, and Notable Operations. Mm -hmm. That is an interesting one. And of course, on the 18th of September, we have questions and answers on Naval Street till the brew runs out. So, here we go. It's the next Columbia class. Mm hmm. However, it won't technically be the Columbia class because there is already a USS Columbia in service and they don't look like they're going to decommission us soon. She's a Los Angeles class vessel. She is not yet 30 years old. So I'm not quite sure what happened. Um, I think someone had the bright idea we needed to call these ships the Columbia class. And the US Navy has so many submarines in the service and so many ships in the service. No one realized that one of those ships in the service was the Columbia. Or maybe they did. Maybe I'm being cynical and uncharitable here. Anyway, the SSB and NX program, the replacements for the Ohio's, which are currently listed as the Columbia class, are technically going to have the USS District of Columbia as their first member. <laughs> It happens. This is what happens when you're building enough ships. Trust me, the Royal Navy did the same when they had hundreds of ships. But still, it's going to be an SSBN. And currently it's at, and also Columbia itself is currently an SSN. And I know people are going to sit here and go, well, that makes sense. They're, uh, the SSN is a successor of the Commerce Raiding Cruiser, definitely. And I would agree. But in terms of warfighting role, in terms of peacetime presence and deterrence, that's where you have a problem with submarines. And that's where we have a problem with a lot of things. Submarines are absolutely exceptional weapon systems. As long as they remain able to be stealthy. Now, what could change to make the world less stealthy for the submarines? Well, most people at this point turn around and go, well, sonar or radar or this or that. And I tend to go weather prediction. The big problem for submarines is not sonar nowadays in the future. It's not anything we can really design the system around. Well, when I say we can't really, we haven't yet worked out what sort of technologies we need to design a system to avoid it. Because the problem for submarines that's coming up, and this will affect ballistic missile submarines as well as it will affect nucleus, SSNs, anything, is the more accurate we get at, and more capable we get at predicting the movements of the ocean what the ocean should be doing. And the current weather, current uh, conditions, positions of the moon, all the other things which are going on, temperatures, etc. The more accurate our computer models get, the easier it becomes to spot aberrations where the computer model is missing out on something. And that's the problem. That's the problem for a submarine because at a certain point, the aberrations become, hmm, that aberration doesn't look like a the what a school of whales would look like or a school of dolphins or a pod. That looks like a submarine. Go and investigate it. Now we're not at that point yet. We're not. But every step along the pathway to improve quantum computing or anything like that is a step further to making that a reality. A step closer to a world where the predictive rationale of computer programs allows us to see where the outliers are in our day-to-day -day lives. That's scary. Because at the moment, there are lots of people who are pushing submarines because it's a natural thing. 
submarines are able to survive because they have stealth, because they can hide. It's the same idea that pushes the F-35 and the F-22 and all sorts of aircraft and systems we're talking about today. But whereas the conversation of whether or not the F-35 has enough stealth is a routine conversation to have, the conversation of whether or not we have enough stealth for submarines and what their future is going to be like is rarely heard. So with that as an ending topic, I thought I would have an interesting question for you all for this. The Columbia class cruisers were built around speed. They built around speed and range to be commerce raiders. Columbia class as an SSN is built around speed, range and lethality, really, but mostly stealth, one can argue, of being a submarine. We've had speed. We've had firepower, we've had armor, and now also we have now stealth. Considering the proviso that the odds are speed won't come again for ships or submarines because hypersonics have entered the world and they're going to be a lot faster than anything a ship can be, what do we think the next how to put a core principle or uh, one-stop shop will be after stealth. What do you think will be the successor to stealth as the thing everyone's going, oh, you have to have that to survive one battlefield. I'd really like to know what you all think. Looking at the progression of history, looking at how things have evolved, what do you think the next thing down the road is going to be? Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you again for all your support. Um, the new computer I'm going to build, all the research trips I'm able to do, all the things I'm doing would not be possible without your support. They really wouldn't be, because in a small update to what's going on in my life, um, some of my academic jobs have been <laughs> re-rolled as uh, academic support, which is, despite me doing the, still doing the teaching and still instructing the students, apparently is not an academic role, which changes pay structures and all sorts of things. It's going to be interesting to work it out when new contracts come through. Anyway, that makes all this even more important to hmm, not just the financial level and actually paying for my research, because that means any research uh, the, limits my opportunities for getting other research funding. Those changes do by a long way, dramatically. Or I'm applying for tenured posts. So not too worried. But more it's a case of the support, the friendship, the kindness you all show me really does help when it comes to going, hmm, am I doing something worthwhile? So thank you and have a nice evening. This is why I should have got the mouse out.